Good afternoon. It's good to see everybody. Uh, hope that many of you are returning from last night's talk, which uh, is very interesting and I think illuminating for a lot of us to learn about the, the Coptic Christian tradition from the Arab invasion uh, to the Ottoman Empire. A lot to cover there. Uh, today's lecture this afternoon and uh, this evening proved to be equally interesting. Uh, we have uh, asked today for a couple of local uh, clergy people to offer invocations. And so to get us started this afternoon, I'd like to invite to the podium uh, Dr. Or, uh, Father David Romanek from the Church of Heavenly Rest here in town to come and uh, begin our time with an invocation. Father Romanek. Good afternoon. It's good to be with you today. Would you please pray with me? O oh God, who created all peoples in your image, we thank you for the wonderful diversity of races and cultures in this world. Enrich our lives by ever-widening circles of fellowship, and show us your presence in those who differ most from us, until our knowledge of your love is made perfect in our love for all your children. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's our great honor to have His Grace Bishop Suriel continuing his series of lectures on Coptic Muslim interactions across the centuries. And as we get going with this lecture, I have a few housekeeping points to make. On the tables near the door by the exit, there are some sign-up sheets for information from the Abilene Interfaith Council. You can sign up and receive information from them, and we thank the council again for their sponsorship uh, together with the Lilly Fellows Program of these lectures. There is also a sign-up sheet for the religion department if you'd like to be on the list to receive information about future lectures in religion and philosophy. We also have a question box with some pieces of paper. So as questions arise, which you would like the bishop uh, to address uh, this evening, please write them down. And there is also a sheet for any ACU students who may be here which has the information on how to get chapel credit for attending the lecture today. The topic of His Grace's lecture this afternoon is Copts and Muslims in the Early Nationalist Movement, 1879 to 1919. So without further ado, it's my honor to introduce to you again His Grace, Bishop Surin. Thank you so much, Father Philip, and it's a, a pleasure to be with you again here this afternoon and uh, to discuss this important topic, speaking now a bit more further in history, um, at the turn uh, of the 20th century, and to look at this interesting dynamic that was happening between uh, Copts and Muslims and British occupation that had happened at the time and how the Copts and Muslims interacted and actually uh, unified together in this nationalist movement. But uh, before I, I begin uh, to discuss this with you, I just uh, wanted to say yesterday's lecture, if anyone's interested uh, to know more about uh, what I discussed about the early Islamic uh, period all the way up to the Ottoman, period, there's two wonderful books from two excellent Coptic scholars. The first one is called From Byzantine to Islamic Egypt, Religion, Identity and Politics After the Arab Conquest, and this is by Maggot Mikhail. So that's uh, the cover of his book, if anyone uh, 
is interested, I highly recommend it. And Maggot is an excellent scholar. And in fact, he was uh, one of my mentors when I was doing my PhD at uh, Fordham uh, University, but he teaches in, uh, in Los Angeles. And the second book um, is titled Coptic Christianity in Ottoman Egypt by Professor Phoebe Armenius. Again, a really excellent book and really covers very well all of the Ottoman period. So those were uh, two of the main sources, sources that I referred to in my uh, lecture yesterday. So they'll be here if anyone's interested to know more information uh, about those two uh, books. And I hope actually in my uh, new series of my podcast called Coffee with Bishop Suriel that I will have a, a, a podcast with both of these two scholars uh, to engage with them more in the discussion uh, on this very important topic. So let's get started. Um, and also, uh, today's lecture, if anyone's interested, there is another excellent book by Fekri Andarawas and Alison Andarawas titled Coptic Christians and Muslims in Egypt, Two Communities, One Nation, published by American University Press uh, in 2019. So yesterday's lecture focused on Coptic Muslim relations from early Islam to the Ottoman period. And this afternoon's lecture will focus on the early nationalist movement spanning from 1879 till 1919, and maybe we'll talk a bit further uh, from that date as well, and discuss the ways in which Coptic and Muslim relations evolved during this time. Before we delve in, however, some background history is necessary. In the beginning of the 19th century, Egypt was led by Muhammad Ali Basha from 1805 to around the middle of the century. Ali was an Albanian descent of Albanian descent and had gained military experience under the Ottomans. And he was considered the founder of modern Egypt. His main goal was to form a strong military system in order to control the region. He sent Muslim students abroad to study and upon their return, um, with their advanced technical skills to establish military schools and to train young men in all industrial fields. Through these means, Muhammad Ali was able to recruit many workers to begin developing a modern Egypt. He also brought in European experts to assist with overseeing the building of schools, barrages, dams, factories, and hospitals. The overall general improvement of society and the government in Egypt resulted in a large sense of positivity in Egyptians and in turn assisted in improving Coptic Muslim relations. There is a story that tells of a quarrel between a Copt and a Muslim in which the Muslim complained to the governor of the town of Damietta. The governor then ordered the Copt to be given 500 lashes and paraded through the Coptic quarters as a humiliating lesson to the Copts. However, when Muhammad Ali heard of this event, he imprisoned the governor for five years and imposed a large monetary fine upon him. From the Arab conquest to the present time, better Coptic Muslim relations have often been associated with a stable and orderly central government, and Ali's era was no exception of this. After Muhammad Ali's death in 1849, 
A decade or a decade or so later, in 1863, Khedev Ismail led Egypt, and under his leadership, Coptic Muslim relations continued to improve. Ismail's government called for full equality for Copts. The political system became more inclusive of Copts. A British elite visiting Egypt at the time noted that in an upper Egyptian town of Beba in the south of Egypt, a Coptic mayor was elected even though the town was predominantly Muslim, with only 13 Coptic families. The British woman commented that Copts and Muslims were very tolerant of each other. Ismail was educated in France and Austria and was in awe of the European educational system. So for the first time in Egyptian history, we see a Muslim ruler support the church's educational system and finance Coptic schools that taught modern science, foreign languages, history, geography, and engineering subjects. Ishmael also funded an endowment of 1,500 acres to these Coptic schools that were built under the papacy of Pope Cyril IV, who only reigned for a very short period of time from 1854 till 1861. He was known as the father of reform and also established schools for boys and for girls for the first time in Egypt. However, Ismail lacked financial acumen. His modernization project's cost was more than the government could handle. He spent about 200 million pounds, Egyptian pounds, much of which was borrowed from European lenders at high interest rates that he could not pay back. This led to matters taking a turn for the worse and the end of Ishmael's reign in 1879. Egypt eventually came under British control. And then we need to discuss a very important event or series of events known as the Urabi Revolt. Great Britain took control and occupied Egypt in 1882 after the Urabi Revolt. The revolt took place as a result of British and French control of Egypt's finances due to the disastrous debts acquired by Ishmael Pasha's government. The British used their political acumen in maneuvering their relationships with Muslims and Copts in varying ways to serve their own needs, as, as we will see later. There was by this stage a strong unity between Muslim and Coptic leaders as they traveled through the political maze notwithstanding British efforts to cause a rift between them. Ahmed Orabi lived from 1841 till 1911, learned reading, writing, and mathematics under a Coptic teacher named Michael Ghattas. Orabi also learned the Quran at Al-Azhar University, the main Islamic university in Egypt, and was then accepted into the army where he began to notice discrimination against Egyptians by foreign officers of Turkish, Circassian, and Albanian origin. He himself was not promoted to a full colonel for 19 years. Such matters piqued his political attentiveness and placed him in a prominent position as a future leader. The influence of the British and French increased, and particularly in the, in the administration. A resistance movement began around the motto, quote, Egypt for the Egyptians. 
A new political party was established called the National Party or Al Hizb al Watani. Muhammad Abdu, a Muslim, and Louis Sabongi, a Christian, devised the party's platform. This was a political rather than a religious manifesto. Membership was open to all Egyptians apart from religion or social status. The first mutiny of the Egyptian army's modern history took place on February 18, 1879. About 2,500 officers demonstrated due to them being pushed out to retirement on half salaries. This led to the resignation of the administration and the temporary halting of the decision. The army's unrest continued and the new administration decided to reduce the size of the army from 95,000 troops to a mere 12,000. The Turkish, Circassian and Albanian officers were retained. Reducing the Egyptian army was just one more step in eliminating it altogether in preparation for British control of Egypt. Due to further unrest in the army and more non-Egyptians replacing Egyptian high-ranking officers, Orabi made his move on September 9, 1881 leading high-ranking officers of the army to Abedin Palace, the residence of Tawfiq Pasha, the leader of the country at the time. Orabi demanded the removal of the administration, reinstatement of the parliament, and some other changes concerning the army. After a tense confrontation, the administration was removed and Muhammad Sharif Pasha was installed as the new prime minister. So you can see how much turmoil was all going on in short periods of time. But it was short-lived, and he was forced to resign on February 2, 1882. Another administration was formed, and Orabi became the minister of war. By now, Alexandria was ready to explode. The British fleet were now very close to Alexandria. The Egyptians resented the large presence of foreigners. Some were armed that were exerting control within the city already. A Maltese British citizen killed an Egyptian over a dispute about the rental rate of a donkey. This dispute led to what was known as the slaughter of Alexandria. Forty to fifty foreigners were killed in the violence and up to three hundred in total. Orabi was eventually defeated overnight and the British took control of Egypt. Enemies of the Orabi revolt spread rumors that one of its purposes was to take over Coptic assets. Some mobs tried to take advantage of this, but Orabi put a quick end to any potential violence. He informed all governors to stop this rumor and to protect Coptic assets. Orabi and his close officers were sentenced to death, but the sentence was reduced to exile in Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, the British had finally achieved their goal of gaining control of the Suez Canal and thereby securing their trade route to India. The British remained in Egypt until 1954, where a successful army revolt ousted them along with King Farouk, who was the last of Muhammad Ali's descendants to rule Egypt. And now we need to move to speak about the British, the Muslims, and the Copts, and the nationalist movement. A political Islamic movement that believed that Islam had become corrupt through ignorance and that Muslim countries had been betrayed by their rulers 
spread through Jamal al-Din al-Afghani, 1838-1897, a Shiite Muslim born in Persia, and for a while was supported by Muhammad Abdu, who we spoke about earlier. But then Abdu returned to be a moderate Islamic reformer in Egypt. The British supported political Islam in Egypt and continued to do so. But why? Simply put, if the British support such a movement, the hope was that it would weaken the nationalist movement and hence give the British the upper hand. Abdu was a moderate Islamic thinker, but after his death, he was replaced with his disciple, Rashid Reda. Reda became radicalized and influenced the Muslim Brotherhood movement, as well as its offspring and even more radical jihadist groups. The British maintained control in Egypt during their early years there, through a policy of divide and conquer. This strategy proved successful for them in other territories that were under their control. Furthermore, to strengthening political Islam to counter secular nationalist movements, the British also manipulated the relationship between Copts and Muslims to their own advantage. There were no serious problems between Copts and Muslims between 1882 and 1919, and they did not feel they needed British protection. The Copts held prominent government positions, especially in the fields of tax collection and land surveying. And under British guidance, the government opened a school for tax collection that was attended by Muslims, and this ended Coptic domination in this area. The British not wanting to appear to be favoring Copts, as it would hurt their image in the Islamic world, began slowly to replace some Copts with Muslims in such positions. The Copts began to feel they have been discriminated against by the British. And in 1908, the resistance movement against British occupation that included both Copts and Muslims began to gain strength and to alleviate this tension. The British decided to appoint Botros Ghali Pasha, a Copt, as prime minister. Ghali was later assassinated by a Muslim, which caused much sectarian strife. All this served the purpose of the British, who wanted to preoccupy Egyptians with sectarian tensions. The British did not succeed, and although this incident, among others, created a mood of despair, it did not suppress nationalist aspirations for long. Two resistant, resistance movements against British occupation arose within the following decade, but did not gain much momentum. A wide variety of newspapers sprung up with a whole spectrum of ideologies. At the turn of the century, sectarian tensions reached a peak, and that had not been seen in the past century. The British discreetly encouraged such polarization among religious, along religious lines, an incident that took place on a farm in a small village between British officers and Egyptian farmers got completely out of hand. The British Consul General wanted to make a spectacle of the Egyptians and punish them. A tribunal was held that was overseen by the Copt Botros Ghali. Ninety-two Egyptian farmers were on trial. Four were sentenced to death. Two were sentenced to life in prison. Eleven received sentences 
of 1 to 15 years, and 11 were flogged. The capital punishment and flogging were carried out by British soldiers and in the presence of the local villages. So you can imagine the antagonism that is caused against the British. This had a devastating effect on the villages, and eventually the consul general, whose name was Lord Cromer, was removed from Egypt. Batrus Ghali was assassinated on February 20, 1910, and this added to the sectarian tensions. Newspapers on both sides inflamed the situation, and it led to two conferences. The first, called the Coptic Congress or Coptic Conference in Asyut, in the south of Egypt, and the second, a Muslim conference that took place in Alexandria, both taking place in the same year, 1911. Each conference aired their grievances, but at the end, both conferences marginalized the views expressed by their more extreme attendees, and the rhetoric became less heated. Interestingly, neither conference addressed the issue of British colonial power. It became evident that cooperation between Copts and Muslims was far more important than their differences. At the end of World War I, and the Turkish Empire was dismantled, the Egyptian nationalist movement turned from being a pan-Islamic movement under the leadership of the Turkish Caliphate to an Egyptian nationalist movement. Rejection of pan-Islamism made it possible for Copts to join with Muslims in a joint effort to gain national independence. Hence the British strategy to divide Egyptian loyalties along sectarian lines had failed. In 1917, the British set up a new legislative assembly that also included British ministers and advisers, and decisions had to be approved by the British Foreign Secretary. This made it clear that Britain had no intention to yield control or leave the country any time soon. And now I turn to speak about the revolution and what was known as the Wavd Party. Popular resistance against the British continued to increase, and this is where we see a new le leader emerge who was very famous called Saad Zaghloul. Zaghloul was tall, charismatic, and self confident. He traveled to Europe where he completed a law degree at the University of Paris in 1898, became a lawyer and then a judge in Egypt. Through the approval of Lord Cromer, Zahloul was appointed Minister of Education in 1906 and in 1910 Minister of Justice. In 1913, he was appointed Vice President of the Legislative Assembly. In November of 1918, Zaghloul, along with his three Muslim members, with three Muslim members of the Legislative Assembly, met informally with Sir Reginald Francis Wingate, the British High Commissioner. To discuss the future of Egypt's independence and its relationship with the British. After the Copts knew of this meeting, they endeavored to participate and they were welcomed by Zaghloul. They expanded to 12 members, including three Copts, and the group it, uh, called itself the Wavd, meaning the delegation. This was a secular movement led by Zaghloul, and they used the motto, religion for God, and the nation for all. From this point forward, the Copts became an integral part of the Wavd, which eventually became a fully-fledged political party 
called the Web Party. Zaghloul and later his successor continued to support the Copts as they took an active, not merely symbolic, role in Egyptian politics. Wingate told Zaghloul and his colleagues that Egypt was not capable of self-rule. And this was reported to the Egyptian newspapers. And of course, anti-British sentiment increased and support for the WAF grew. The WAF realized they were not authorized to represent the Egyptian people and began to collect petitions and signatures that started streaming in, despite the fact that there were restrictions to do so during the First World War from the British. The British objected to the participation of the Web Party in the 1919 Paris Peace Conference to put up their case for independence, despite the fact that much smaller countries were permitted to participate. This caused the popularity of the Web Party to increase while opposition of Great Britain grew. Several levels of the Web Party were arrested to try and curtail their activities, but it only made them more popular among the public. A renewed united front between Copts and Muslims now takes place in the face of the resistance of the British to allow independence to the Egyptians. On Coptic Easter 1919, both Copts and Muslims, men and women, turned the day into a national holiday. In a joyful scene of national unity, Muslims turned out in large numbers around the Coptic Cathedral to share the day with Copts. This included Muslims from the Islamic Theology School of Al-Azhar University. This Christian feast turned into an anti-British political demonstration in addition to a display of national unity. This phenomenon was even repeated on a smaller scale in other large cities. The same spectacle was repeated during Muslim religious holidays. Copts turned out to in joint celebration with their Muslim compatriots. These displays of unity were the first of their kind in modern Egyptian history. During this period, religious holidays became national and political holidays. The Zaghloul movement became a strong secular movement. Sectarian tensions were a thing of the past, at least for a few years. This just shows that people of different faiths and beliefs can come together in such signs of unity without having hatred for one another, despite their different theologies and can live in peace and love with each other there are many important lessons to be learned here for today's world. And then I want to move on to something which is also very important, and this was the role of women in the nationalist movement. And this is very significant. Early in the 20th century, women began to have an active role in the nationalist movement on April 24th. 1919, a delegation of Coptic women went to the Sayyida Zainab Mosque in the center of Old Cairo to return the visit by Muslim women to the Coptic Cathedral at Easter. They were well received by high profile Muslim women. Interestingly, such celebratory visits did not stop there but women organized rallies against the British in the streets of Cairo. And there is photos, uh, archival photos, where you can see some of this. In addition to such rallies, they also organized the signing of a petition by women against the British occupation, which they presented to the British High Commissioner. 
Such a demonstration by women was the first of its kind in all of Egypt's history. And many of these women went on to lead the Egyptian feminist movement. In such, it appears there was no difference between Copts and Muslims, and together they became advocates for improving the status of women and of political prisoners. After what was known as the ladies' demonstration that took place in March 1919, elite women continued to protest, picketing ministries during strikes in April, joining street celebrations, publishing articles and poems in the press, and delivering petitions to foreign legations. Alexandrian women produced one such letter of protest in April 1919, using a feminine voice to testify to British injustices in Egypt. As the women of Egypt, they spoke on behalf of those imprisoned, deported, and killed, their brothers, and appealed to the hearts of European and American women. A few women gave their husbands professions, engineer, judge, lawyer, doctor, general prosecutor, chief of finances, head of the postal services, and titles which range from Turkish titles that were given to prominent people at that time, Effendi, Pasha, connoting middle and upper class. And one woman gave her own profession as school director. Many were related, and the mix included Copts as well as Muslims. Elite women also participated in the campaign against what was known as the Mil Milner Mission, sent by the British in early December of 1919 to evaluate the situation in Egypt in light of the unrest. Some 200 women gathered inside St. Mark Church in Cairo on December 12, five days after the mission had arrived to orchestrate a strategy of resistance. They had chosen the site because under martial law, large assemblies were banned in almost all other public places. So they felt safe to do so inside of the Coptic Church. The group composed an open letter of protest to the mission, then drove in a motorcade throughout the city to deliver their message, saying to find out about our nationalist expectations, speak to our designated leaders, the Wavd Party. The next month, in early January of 1920, from 500 to 1,000 women gathered once again at St. Mark Church to establish what was called the Women's Web, and in a secret ballot, they elected 15 members to the Women's Web Central Committee, or WWCC. The committee members were all married, five to Pashas, six to Bays, two to Effendis, and one to a doctor, and most to members of the Web Party. The exception was the unmarried Fikreya Husni, a supporter of the Watani party. Among the largest voters was Hoda, vote getters was Hoda Sharawi, who was at the time in Luxor and whose husband was the vice president of the Web Party. Esther Fahmi Wisa, a Copt, who steered the group in its first meetings as vice president and Sharifa Riyadh. The group declared its purpose to be informing the Wabdist delegation of the loyalty of Egyptian women and their determination to continue the demand for Egypt's complete independence as long as the Web adhered to its proclaimed principles. 
The world remained committed to legal and peaceful means to achieve complete independence. A party of mostly large landowners, it had no interest in encouraging social unrest. The WWCC issued circulars, wrote petitions, staged demonstrations, and organized boycotts. Through these actions, the women's web acted in unity with the web leadership. Even as the ranks of men split in the first years, women stayed firm, considering themselves above partisan politics and capable of healing rifts. After the formation of the WWCC and the number of branch committees, the Central Group received petitions signed by female residents of Cairo and the provinces throughout Egypt, authorizing the committee to speak on their behalf. This petition campaign reenacted one conducted on behalf of the Wealth Party before its leadership was exiled in 1919. For example, women in Asyut, in Upper Egypt, sent in a petition stating, we the undersigned declare that we have mandated the following ladies, Hoda Sharawi, Esther Fahmi Wisa, Sharifa Riyad, Regina Hayat, to establish a central Wafdis committee of Egyptian ladies to carry out all the national functions which would lead to complete independence according to the principles of the Web Party and to enable them to represent us before all institutions." End of quote. The head of the Society of Union and Progress of Egyptian Women in Tanta, another city in Egypt, also sent a letter of support. Petitions became a favorite tool of the women's web. The WWCC pledged full support to the Wav Party and imagined itself as the mirror image or feminine half or the central committee of the central committee of the Wav Party. They even called the latter the Men's Wav Central Committee. They considered themselves part advisory committee, part publicist for the Wav Party and strove to be in the heart of the action, as they called it. The committee met regularly, weekly in its first months, or more often, if necessary, to discuss current affairs. It is fascinating to realize the immense role that both Coptic and Muslim women played in the nationalist movement in Egypt at the turn of the 20th century and how they were able to resolve problems amicably, unlike some of the men. And now to look at the Wabdas party members, how they were exiled by the British. Tensions and the, move and the movement against the British accelerated. Violence increased and there were casualties on both sides. On March 8, 1919, the British arrested Zaghloul and three other Wav party heads and exiled them to Malta. The next day, all throughout Egypt's large cities, protests arose like wildfire. What is interesting, and maybe for the first time in history, that Muslim sheikhs delivered anti-British speeches in Coptic churches and priests Coptic priests did the same in mosques, including Al Azhar Mosque. A new flag became the symbol of the nationalist movement with a crescent hugging a cross with a green background as a symbol for national unity. The British Consul General was replaced by Field Marshal Edmund Allenby. The new Consul General released Zaghloul and his companions from Malta and ended their exile. Despite their release, 
the protests and violence continued to escalate. Egyptians wanted only one thing, and that was their independence from the British and to have full control of their country. Finally, the British Consul General gave in and allowed a delegation of the Weft Party to travel to Paris. And upon arrival to Paris, U.S. President Woodrow Wilson, who had previously supported the right of the people to self-determination, announced U.S. recognition of the British mandate over Egypt. This was a huge blow to the Egyptians, but the revolution continued. Other attempts were made or offered by the British to calm the situation, including an invitation to Zahloul and his colleagues to go to London for discussions, which were unsuccessful. Nothing less than full independence would be acceptable to the Egyptians. The Egyptian delegation went back to Egypt on April 15, 1921. The protests continued, and the British decided this time to exile Zadlul, along with five other leaders, of whom three were Copts, to the Seychelles, a British colony in the Indian Ocean. Several Weft Party executive committees came and went with no resolution to the problem. The British tried another strategy, and that was to end Egypt's status as a protectorate. But Egyptians objected to this too. The resentment of the Egyptians continued until British, the British finally left Egypt in 1954. Zaghloul and the other five leaders were released from exile and returned to Egypt on March 31, 1923. The first election took place in September 1923, which was won by the Wealth Party, gaining 90% of the 214 seats in Parliament. Zaghloul, of course, headed the new administration in a landslide victory. The new government was made up of 10 appointed members, two of whom were Copts and one Jewish member. When King Ahmed Fuad objected to choosing two Copts and suggested having only one, Zaghloul responded, saying, we do not make a distinction between Copts and Muslims, end of quote. The Wealth Party, ruled for seven years out of the three decades between 1923 and 1952. There was at times interference by the British and the King of Egypt. And during such times, the Wealth Party did not engage in those elections. Throughout this time, the percentage of parliamentary seats held by Copts went from 7.5% down to 2.5% in 1950. From 1952 to the recent present, fewer than 1% of seats in Parliament have been held by Copts. Zaghloul's first administration did not stay in power for more than 10 months its downfall was swift, dramatic, and demonstrates the weakness of the elected government in the face of concerted opposition from the British and the King. Many more problems happened in these three decades till the British finally left in 1954 that we do not have time to discuss here. And now I want to move to speak briefly about political Islam and the Copts. The Caliphate was abolished in 1923 when the Turkish army officer Kemal Ataturk declared Turkey a modern republic. In Egypt, two schools of thought arose in response to the loss of the Turkish Caliphate. 
The first proposed filling the void by having the Egyptian king replace the old Turkish caliph. The second, which appeared a few years later, proposed establishing the Muslim Brotherhood to assume the authority of the caliphate with the ultimate goal of setting up a government based on Islamic principles. The Muslim Brotherhood was established by Hassan al-Banna in 1928. Al-Banna was a charismatic preacher who was influenced by the Wahhabi sect of Islam in Arabia. Al-Banna tried to get elected to parliament to try to revive the caliphate, but he failed. He then founded an underground paramilitary wing of the Muslim Brotherhood to stir up political instability in order for the Muslim Brotherhood to gain power. This wing of the Muslim Brotherhood began a campaign of violence and terror that included the assassination of two prime ministers, as well as judges and police officers. These attacks increased over time. Despite al-Banna repeating in several statements that the Muslim Brotherhood was not hostile towards minorities, the Muslim Brotherhood used both mosques and leaflets to spread anti-Coptic messages. The Copts resented this, though some conceded that the problem was not with Islam itself, but with those adherents who twisted its teaching. Violent incidents against the Copts by the Muslim Brotherhood increased in the 1930s and 1940s. By the 1940s, the Muslim Brotherhood had become too powerful for any party, including the Waft Party, to defy openly. The Muslim Brotherhood emerged as the master of the streets with an armed underground force and sympathizers estimated in the thousands. The government at the time was willing to allow some violence against the Copts, as a convenient safety valve to release the frustrations of the masses. And sometimes it simply was incapable of containing it. As the situation worsened, some Coptic newspapers called for the dissolution of the Muslim Brotherhood and all organizations that mixed religion with politics. The government finally, and by mere chance, discovered the secret place the Muslim Brotherhood stored their weapons. Realizing the seriousness and the magnitude of the threat, the government moved to dissolve the society of the Muslim Brotherhood in 1949. When the Welf Party was re-elected in January 1950, they allowed the Muslim Brotherhood to return though some parts of the organization remained underground. This sectarian strife continued and took prominence again during the short presidency of Mohammed Morsi. And we will discuss this period briefly in our third lecture. Thank you for your attention. Thank His Grace Bishop Suriel for another fascinating and informative lecture. Our third and final lecture will be this evening at 7, Cooperation or Coexistence, Modern Developments in the 20th and 21st Centuries Between Cops and Muslims. And we look forward to seeing you there, here. And if you would like to uh, leave questions for His Grace to address this evening, please do so on the table as you leave, uh, where you can also sign up for information about future religion lectures and across the aisle for information from the Abilene Interfaith Council. 
So uh, thank you all for your attendance, and we hope to see you this evening. Thank you.